so tonight we want to talk about overcoming temptations like Jesus. Let's open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 2. Start at verse 14. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. For assuredly he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. So look at that last verse especially. Since he was tempted, he's able to come to the aid of those who were tempted. Jesus was tempted. You might say, oh, come on. Jesus was God. He couldn't have really been tempted. No, but the Bible tells us he was. He actually was tempted. That's why he understands what that means. You might say, what does temptation mean, actually? Well, it's when it's kind of like a test. You're in a situation, and you know what you should do. But there's something inside of you that really wants to do the opposite. And it can be something silly like, I'm going to eat the whole cake, even though you know you're going to get sick if you do. But you just give in to that, and then afterward your stomach's all blah. That's something silly. But there's other things, temptations, which are very serious, like I'm going to walk into sin. I'm going to walk out of love. I'm going to do something mean or evil. I'm going to be selfish. Those temptations are there for every person that's alive. Because sin is in the world, and Satan is always trying to get you to give in and to let your flesh go and follow your emotions and follow your desires and give in to peer pressures and do the things you know better than to do. When I was was growing up, there was a show on TV in the 70s called Laughing, and they had this one actor would come on every week and do this skit, and he would stand up and say, the devil made me do it, and everybody would laugh. The devil made me do it. Week after week, he would do that, and everybody would laugh. Why was that funny? In reality, that was not true. The devil did not make him do anything that he did wrong. He always had a choice. And you have a choice, and so do I. Am I going to do what's right in the sight of God, or am I going to give in to my flesh and just do what I feel like? Well, Jesus went through temptation, and I thought it would be good if we looked at some of the things that he went through. Maybe so you would relate to him better, and also to understand that he overcame those things. There's so many things I found, it's going to take us two weeks to get through it. But we'll start tonight with Matthew chapter 4. Something that if you've read the Bible at all, you know about. It's called the temptation in the wilderness. Jesus was tempted specifically. The devil let him out to tempt him. So let's start here at Matthew 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you're the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We'll stop there for just a moment. This was right after Jesus was baptized by John. And the Holy Spirit came down upon him. He was filled with the Spirit. As um, other verses say, he had the Spirit without measure. Filled with the Holy Spirit, freshly baptized. You'd think he'd be on a high, but that's exactly when the devil comes. When everything's looking good to you. Just because you're filled with the Holy Spirit does not mean the devil will not try to tempt you. Jesus went 40 days and 40 nights without food in this wilderness. It's not like in Ramadan you hear about them, they they fast in the day, but then they eat at night. No, Jesus literally had no food whatsoever day and night for 40 days, which would mean 
that his body was probably reaching the starvation level. When you get to the starvation level, then your body starts eating itself. Your organs start shutting down. He was close to death. If he'd have gone on like that, he wouldn't have made it. And that's exactly when the devil came, when he was the weakest, when he would have been feeling it intensely. The devil came and said, if you're the son of God. Now, first, of course, he has to question that. The devil always likes that if question. Remember, he did that to Adam and Eve, too. Did God really say? He knew good and well what God said. But he wanted them to doubt what God said. Well, now he's coming to Jesus, if you're the son of God. Prove it to me. Prove it to me. You know, Jesus didn't have to prove anything to the devil. And neither do you. We don't have to prove anything to the devil. It says, command, these stones become bread. You notice Jesus' answer here was, quoting scripture, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Jesus went back to the word to answer the devil. That's exactly what we have to do. Why did he say that? Would it not have been okay for him to turn stones into bread? Well, no, because God didn't tell him to do it. See, Jesus was living according to what God told him to do. God did not say, Jesus, go ahead, turn those stones into bread and eat something. Now, it's been too long. You haven't eaten. Now, it's not that Jesus couldn't turn stones into bread or Jesus couldn't make bread because we know he fed 5,000. He made bread and fish, and then he fed 4,000 and did it again. Jesus was capable of creating bread, but God did not tell him to do it, and so he did not. He was not supposed to meet his own needs. Second temptation. Let's go back to verse 5 now. And the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you're the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. See, Satan saw Jesus quoting scripture. I better quote something too, except the devil usually misquotes. He didn't quote the whole thing here. He quoted part of Psalm 91 in order to try to get Jesus to throw himself down, to break the laws of nature. God set those laws in motion, by the way, the law of gravity. He would have had to break that and then expect the angels to come and rescue him. That would have been acting like God. But Jesus was there as a man. He was there as a man in obedience to God. And so Jesus quoted the word right back to him. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. It was not his place to test God. Again, he had nothing to prove to the devil. So one more thing the devil tried on him. Verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, go, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Some people, some people might think, oh, that wasn't really a temptation. The devil could not have given him the kingdoms of the world and their glory. But yes, let's think a minute. When Adam sinned, he gave over the right of rulership in the world to the devil. The devil actually had the right to the kingdoms of the world. He's the ruler of this world until Jesus came and defeated him. So for him to say, I'll give it to you, basically he was offering Jesus a shortcut. You must be here because you want to take this place back. I'll just give it to you. But one condition, you worship me. Well, the devil would have loved that. He'd have gone to the father and said, Father, ha ha, Jesus worship me, not you. Uh, Jesus would have never, ever given in to that. That's why he said, go. Sometimes you just have to say, Satan, get out of here. For us, we use the name of Jesus. We say, in the name of Jesus, Satan, get out of here right now. Throw him out. Jesus had enough of his mess, his lies, his tricks. He said, just get out. It's, it is written. And then he answered with the scripture again. It is written. You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. You notice at that point, 
the devil had to go. He had no choice. And angels came and began to minister to him. I'm sure God said, okay, angels, now you can help him, feed him, give him something, make sure he's strong enough because he has to go on now. God was going to take care of him, but God was going to take care of him his way, not the devil's way. We got to be careful that what we're doing is following God's way because God's way is always best. So the devil left for, for a moment. And now it says in Luke 4.13, this is the same, talking about the same event, Luke 4.13, it says, when the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. See, the devil didn't give up. He was just waiting. He left till an opportune time, waiting, looking for another opportunity to try to get at Jesus. Well, here's another one that he tried. John 2, verses 23 to 25. Talking about Jesus here. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs, which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. See, these people, they were getting excited. Wow, Jesus, ooh, healing people. Wow, look at the things he said. Praise. This was a temptation to give in to the praise of men. You know, when Sometimes when you're serving God and things are going well, people will start to try to praise you. They try to build you up, but you don't count on that. If you start giving in to that praise of people always lifting you up and t- saying how great you are and what a good job you're doing, and man, then nobody can do it like you and all that kind of stuff, the temptation is to get careless. This is not safe ground to stand on. You could easily fall into pride. And if you fall into pride, the devil has a hand, can have a hand on your life. We can't give in to that. Jesus knew what people were like. He knew they were fickle. One day they're praising him. The next day they were crying, crucify him. Isn't that what happened? Hosanna to the son of David as he comes into Jerusalem a couple days later. Crucify him, crucify. People flip like that. You can't trust the praise of man. Luke 6, 26 tells us, Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same way. Why is it woe to you? Why is it woe to you? Because you're not on solid ground anymore if you're dependent on the praise of men. The false prophets were praised because they said exactly what the people wanted to hear. There are several accounts in the Old Testament of kings who would call in false prophets when they wanted to go to war, and they'd say, should I fight this battle? Am I going to win? And the false prophet would say, oh, yeah, oh, king, you're going to win. It's going to be wonderful. You're taking all the glory from this one. And then the king would go out on that fly and be defeated. Sometimes the king was killed. The army was destroyed. And the consequences were there. But man, that man said exactly what he wanted to hear. Made him feel good. But was that what he needed? Nah, he needed someone to tell him the truth. There's one occasion where a prophet of God came and said, you're going to be defeated. And the king got so mad he had him locked up. But guess what? He was defeated. All these other prophets were lying, saying what they wanted to hear. We need to look not for people that say what you want to hear, but that tell you what God says. Because that's how you build your life. There was another time when people, he, Jesus could have been tempted. That was John 6, verses 14 to 15. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, this is truly the prophet who's to come into the world. So Jesus, perceiving they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. This was right after Jesus fed the 5,000. And these people were not wrong. They're saying, this guy, this is the prophet. This is the one that's supposed to come. Let's make him king right now. But see, that was not the plan of God. It was not the plan of God. And he couldn't have argued with him because, he would, was he, what's he going to say? No, I'm not the prophet. Yes, he was. He was the Messiah, for real. He couldn't tell him he wasn't the Messiah, but these people didn't understand what that meant. They thought a political king, 
Someone who's going to come in here and get rid of the Romans and free Israel from their, from their dictatorship and build them a country again. But see, if Jesus had let them make him a king and he knew they were about to force him, they were about to, to grab him and, and, you know, drag him off and try to do that thing. He just got out. That was the best choice he could make. If he'd have gone in along with that, the Romans would have heard. You better believe they would have heard, and they'd have been there quick, ready to kill him. He would not have fulfilled his ministry. He would not have died for the sins of the world. That was, again, Satan, through those people, offering him a shortcut. See, just, I'll make you a king. Go ahead, be a king. Be a political king if you want, yeah, for about maybe three days till the Romans come. Jesus knew better. Sometimes you just have to get out. You can't argue with people. There are people who will not listen to you. There is no such thing as reason for them. Sometimes you just have to walk away, just like Jesus did. You know, there are no shortcuts to obedience. You have to walk the whole path. Here's another time when Satan would like to have used women to try to distract Jesus from what he needed to do. John 8, this is an interesting one. John 8, 3 to 11. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. And having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then, what then do you say? They were saying this testing him so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. But when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to him, He who's without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones. And as he was left alone and the woman where she was in the center of the court, straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go. From now on, sin no more. Why did Jesus stoop down and write in the ground? See, they said, uh, in my translation here, it says, we caught that this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. If they caught her in adultery in the very act and somebody walked into that bedroom, she's probably naked or barely dressed. They ignored the man, by the way. The law of Moses would have said, bring both of them and stone them, not just the woman, the man and the woman. They let the man go, but they grabbed this woman out of bed and drug her out there, undressed. Maybe she grabbed a sheet or something to try to cover herself, but they're dragging her along, throw her down on the ground. Look, we should kill her. Let's stone her right now, Jesus. What do you say? They want to test Jesus. What's he going to do? Jesus probably at one glance saw, ooh, not dressed got his eyes on the ground. Jesus did something which is really exemplary for all men. He stooped and he wrote on the ground, I am not looking at that. Why? Because if you want to or not, seeing a naked woman could just, the devil could use that to set off all kinds of thoughts. And he would not allow the devil to mess with his mind. He kept his eyes down. He wrote on the ground. What was he writing? We don't know. But when he had to answer the men, he looked at the men and said, if you're without sin, you throw the first stone. Now he wrote some more, got down again, kept his eyes on the ground and wrote. And so many people say maybe he was writing out some of those men's sins. We don't know what he wrote. But whatever he wrote, those men got convicted and they started walking off. Man. I can only do this if I haven't sinned myself. Shoot, what did I do yesterday, man? What did I do last week? Any man with a conscience left. The older ones left first because they had more to account for. At least they were that honest. Until every one of them left, Jesus still looking down. Now he stood up and looked at the woman. By that time, I'm sure she had covered herself with something, done her best, and he dealt with her and her real problem. Woman, where are they? He said, neither do I condemn you from now on sin no more. 
I'm not condemning you today. I'm not going to kill you, but change what you're doing. That's not the way you should be living. He told her what she needed to do, but he also set her free. He gave her a chance. He had mercy on her. See, he was able to hear what the Holy Spirit was saying because he did not allow his eyes to look at her and so the devil could try to get at his thoughts. He did not allow the devil to mess with his thoughts. It's hard sometimes because around us there's so much nudity. But we have to always guard our eyes so the devil cannot play with your mind. Jesus knew how to handle it. Some other times when Jesus could have been moved in the wrong direction. Luke 7, here's a woman coming to him this time. And the Bible calls her a sinner. Hmm. What kind of woman do you suppose would be called a sinner? Probably a prostitute. Luke 7, start up verse 37. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping him with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing him with the perfume. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he'd know who and what sort of person this woman is who's touching him, that she's a sinner. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. A money lender had two de debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one that he forgave more. And he said to him, you've judged correctly. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. Then he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, just think about this story for a moment. This is this is not a story. This really happened. Jesus is there at a Pharisee's house. And this woman comes in, crying on his feet, kissing his feet, wiping him with her hair, and anointing him with perfume. And the Pharisee is probably giving him all kind of dirty looks. Would it not be tempting to just kind of give her a shove and say, just get out of here. I didn't come in here for this. I'm trying to talk to this Pharisee here. Don't you know what I'm here for? I mean, I came for this. I'm trying. But Jesus didn't do that, did he? It would have been tempting to get impatient. It would have been tempting to try to push her aside. I mean, they said she's a sinner. I mean, what do you want to do with them? But Jesus was there for the sinners. Instead of pushing her away, he listened to the Holy Spirit. And he figured out what she needed. She was not doing that to put on a show. That woman was broken. That woman is crying. Why would a prostitute cry at Jesus' feet? Because her life was a mess. Because she had knew this guy. This guy could change things for me. Maybe she heard him forgiving that other guy who healed. Remember the guy that was let down through the roof? Jesus forgave him first before he healed him. Maybe she heard, this is a man who can forgive sins. Wow, I really need that. I really need that. Man, I, I've had enough of this life. She just came to him. This woman came in a broken state, and Jesus was sensitive enough to know what was going on. Instead of treating her poorly, he focused in on her need. And he gave her what she came for, forgiveness. No greater gift is there. A chance to start over. Jesus. 
knew how to be sensitive to people, to listen in to what was going on for real. Another person similar to that was in John 12. She was not a prostitute, but she also did something that could have made him very uncomfortable. That was Mary. John 12. Start at verse 3. Actually, can we back up to verse 1? Is that possible? Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving. But Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples who was intending to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to poor people? Now he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. Therefore Jesus said, Let her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. This was an interesting situation. Lazarus had been raised from the dead. This was right before the Passover, before Jesus was crucified. And he went to Lazarus's house. There's a bunch of people there. There's her brother. There's her sister Martha serving dinner. Everybody's there. The disciples are there. A lot of people are there. And Mary brought this perfume out. Now, they said this pure nard was equivalent to 11 months wages. This was an extremely expensive perfume. And traditionally, that perfume was only used on a wedding night. Something that valuable. But she poured it on Jesus' feet. Now, why did she do that? You know, I thought there could have been different reasons. Maybe she was just so extremely grateful that he had raised Lazarus from the dead. Maybe she just wanted to show Jesus how devoted she was to him. Maybe she really in her heart thought, couldn't have a better husband than Jesus. Maybe maybe Jesus wants to marry me because he would be the perfect husband. I mean, who could be better than that? We don't know what she was thinking. We can't read her mind. But this could have been an embarrassing situation. It was kind of intimate. Pouring that kind of perfume on his feet, the whole house smelled like it. There was no avoiding it. There's no pretending it didn't happen. And wouldn't you know, Judas had to open his mouth and get right in there and try to shame her for it. Mary could have been totally humiliated that day. Because, of course, Jesus was standing right before the cross. Jesus could not become a husband and a father. He came to save the whole world. If Jesus had reacted wrongly, she would have been embarrassed. But he did not allow Judas to do that to her. Judas tried to shame her. Why didn't you sell this perfume? He wanted the money. Uh-uh. Jesus said, leave her alone. He defended her. In order that she may keep it for the day of my burial for the poor you always have with you. But you don't always have me. Jesus set, the, set things straight. What she did was a good thing. Knowing that he was about to die. This was honoring to me. Jesus honored Mary for her gift of devotion. He honored her heart of love. And he did not allow Judas to shame and humiliate and embarrass her in front of her family, in front of the disciples, in front of who knows how many people were in that house. See how sensitive Jesus was to that woman's feelings. Anyone less spiritual might have made it a very humiliating experience. Jesus knew how to deal with people. But how did Jesus have that kind of sensitivity? He was always listening to the Holy Spirit. And Jesus was full of the word. That's how Jesus overcame anything the devil tried to get him to do wrong. He listened to the Holy Spirit. Luke 4.14 tells us that Jesus, go ahead, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. 
Jesus went in the power of the Holy Spirit. He stayed. Remember, he stayed in contact with God all the time. He prayed all the time. He had the Holy Spirit inside of him, constantly listening, constantly hearing. But something else he did. He listened to what the word said. Psalm 119. Let's look at that for just a brief moment. How the word of God can help us overcome temptation. Psalm 119. We're just going to pick out a couple places from there. Psalm 1199, how can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. With all my heart I've sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Your word I've treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. If you want to keep your life straight, you want to keep your life pure, do what the word of God says. It says your word in my heart will help me not to sin. That is extremely valuable. Now, verse 89 tells us, Forever, Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. The word of God is settled in heaven. What does that mean? What God said, is it's done. He's not going to change it, not going to change his mind. He's not going to have a new fashion or a new thought. No. If God says something, it's always that way. Verse 898 to 100. This is interesting. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are mine. I have more insight than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, because I have observed your precepts. That's saying quite a bit, isn't it? I understand. I'm wiser than my enemies. I have more insight than my teachers. I understand more than the age. All of that comes from knowing the word of God. Remember when I was pretty young, just starting off in ministry. I mean, I went to Bible school at 18, 19, 20, and I was, you know, in school with people much older than myself. Sometimes I'd hear from someone, wow, you're really wise. And I'd think, (laughs) that's pretty funny. Because actually what I did was be quiet. I don't say everything I think. And I'm reading the Bible. I'm just trying to just trying to do what God says. Just do my best here, you know. People thought I was wise, but no, I just listened to what God said. Sometimes if you just don't say everything you think, people will think you're pretty smart. Yeah, the word of God will show us the right way to go and what we need to do. Verse 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You need to know the way to go. We need to get in the word. If we will just dig into the word. Sometimes you think, man, the Bible won't tell me about that. God didn't talk about everything, but yes, he did. He won't say directly, go down Brown Street and then turn right. The Bible doesn't say that kind of stuff. However, he will give you direction. And you'll know, you read things and you know, oh, that's what God wants me to do. Because the Holy Spirit knows how to quicken that word to your situation. Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. Verse 130, 130, it says, the unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. The unfolding of your words gives light. You ever been reading the Bible? And all of a sudden, something just goes, oh, wow. Oh, wow, I understand. Man, I didn't know what to do before. Wow, that that makes perfect sense to me. The word, the Holy Spirit quickens that word to you, and all of a sudden, oh, light. I understand. I know what to do. One more, verse 165. Those who love your law have great peace, and nothing causes them to stumble. You need peace in your life? Just get back in the word. Read what God says. Nothing causes them to stumble. Why not? Because we're walking in the light of God. We're walking according to the word. Jesus overcame. And he lived as a man. We can overcome too. If we will just stand in the power of the spirit and get in the word every day, look at what God has to say and do things his way. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, precious Holy Spirit, for teaching us tonight. I ask you to quicken your word to our hearts. Help us to be strong like Jesus was. Help us to walk 
in obedience to you, reading your word, doing as it says. Lord, make us stronger. So no matter what the devil tries to throw at us, we're well able to overcome. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.